and uh, other genomic technologies. And I think many of you know me. And uh, welcome. And today is also happens to be Chinese New Year. And uh, for those of you uh, who doesn't know, it's a year of ox. And uh, in Chinese calendar, every 12 years, this animal is going to uh, repeat, and uh, this year it happens to be the year I was born. So I was 20, I'm 24 this year. I just think I'm 24 this year, and that will be pretty good. Um, and um, uh, so, so uh, for all the Chinese uh, origin um, uh, attendee, and uh, Happy New Year. And this is a very important big deal. All right. So uh, now let's go to the seminar today. Uh, and uh, our speaker today is uh, Doc, uh, Spence Fast. And uh, he is from 10X Genomics, and he will be focusing on spatial transcriptomics. Spence, you want to wave to the audience? <laughs> All right, great. Uh, so Spence received his master's degree from University of North Texas Health Science Center in Forensic and invest uh, Investigative uh, Genetics. And after that, uh, he joined the Dover Air Force Base as a research scientist and work on recovering and sequencing of a highly degraded DNA, uh, as well as moving the, the, um, the platform from Sanger sequencing uh, into the next generation sequencing platform. In 2016, he joined the Illumina. That's uh, the time that we start to interact together. Uh, and uh, and the Stevens has been really, really helpful to get our lab started with the Illumina capacity. Uh, in 2019, and Spence joined the 10X Genomics as a science and a technology advisor and focused on scientific communication as well as empowering the customer research. Uh, I have been uh, working with Spence for many years and have listened to many of his lectures, very, uh, very informative and always uh, uh, learned a lot. So, and, uh, and with that, and uh, welcome, Spence, and looking forward your to your talk. Thank you so much, Ilana. I really appreciate that introduction. So let me uh, share my screen here. So um, as we go through, I will not be able to uh, see the chat, but feel free to post any questions you have um, there, and we'll be happy to um, take those at the, at the very end. Um, can we see my, my full screen? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Great. So uh, like you long mentioned, um, Happy New Year to, to everyone. I uh, hope everyone has a happy, healthy, and a prosperous uh, year of the ox. Um, and today I'm going to really focus on talking about uh, Visium, our spatial gene expression platform uh, that we have here at Tenex Genomics. So if you aren't familiar with who we are, uh, 10X Genomics um, is a relatively new company. We were founded in 2012, and uh, we're mostly known for our single cell uh, genetic application. So we released our first single cell assay in 2016. And you know, really from there, uh, we just been building upon that technology. Um, and really our goal at 10X is to you know, build products to help facilitate research and to better understand, and you know, something that Serge, our CEO, always says, you know, he wants to master biology and utilize um, single cell, spatial, and in situ sequencing to really master biology to help advance uh, human health. Uh, so, you know, we're based out of uh, Pleasanton, um, but uh, myself, I, I live uh, down in Dallas. Um, I recently was uh, living in Plainfield, uh, Indiana, so right down the street uh, from from campus there at IU. Um, so one thing that we're really proud of is, you know, how researchers have really embraced uh, 10x genomics technologies. So, um, you know, like I mentioned, our first single cell assay came out in 2016, and, you know, we've really seen this exponential growth in uh, publications using our technology. Um, so recently, earlier this year, um, in 2021, we've hit uh, over 2,000 publications using our technology. And what's really exciting is, you know, when we think about the 21st century being the, you know, century of biology, I think we're just really on the cutting edge of, you know, what we can do in single cell genomics. And, you know, we're really on the forefront of what we can do uh, in, in the spatial resolution, um, thinking about gene expression. So today we're going to really focus on Visium, our spatial gene expression platform. And 
Um, you know, I just want to highlight that, you know, Visium was released at the very end of 2019, you know, right before the pandemic. Um, but it's been really exciting to see people, you know, really embrace this spatial technology and seeing what's uh, the publications that are just starting to come out now. Um, one thing we're really proud of is that uh, the scientists voted Visium uh, spatial gene expression as one of the top innovations of uh, 2020. And Nature Methods uh, voted spatially resolved transcriptomics as their method of 2020 as well. And um, that picture on the cover is a picture of Visium data. So, you know, we're, you know, really excited to, you know, see what you guys can do um, uh, with gene expression studies and when we think about the spatial context of that. So I love starting with this quote when I talk about Visium, and this is from Dr. David Craig at the University of Southern California. And he said, everyone's waiting for spatial. Without context, you can only learn so much. And you know, I hope as we go through this presentation today, talking about spatial gene expression, um, you know, by the end, I hope you agree with Dr. Craig and myself, and you're really excited to start your own uh, spatial gene expression experiments. So, you know, when we talk about single cell, a lot of times, you know, at 10x, we're talking about multi omics or multimodal, you know, experiments, like how many different pieces of data can we get from, you know, a, a single cell. And Visium and spatial gene expression is really just another multimodal assay if we kind of think about what we're doing. It's really the, the combination of two different uh, data sets. And the first you can see over on the left-hand side is this histological image. So um, as we talk about the workflow um, in just a couple moments, you know, Visium, we're gonna capture an image of a piece of tissue. And then we're gonna go through, uh, you know, a bunch of molecular biology steps. And then we're gonna generate gene expression libraries that we sequence. And, um, you know, if you've ever looked at single cell data, this should look pretty familiar. This is a UMAP plot where each one of these uh, spots represents a, or each one of these dots represents a cell, or in the case of Visium, a spot of data. And Visium is really the combination of these two data modalities where we can take this image, we can generate uh, gene expression from that exact same piece of tissue, and then overlay the gene expression data right on top of the tissue and, and see where this gene expression originated. And this is an actual uh, piece of, of Visium data here in the center. So, you know, why is understanding the spatial context of gene expression important? And I, I think this um, immunofluorescence data really highlights this. Um, on the left-hand side, we have a, what's called a hot tumor, right? Where we have the tumor cells stained purple, the immune cells stained in green. And, you know, just by, you know, glancing at these two pictures, you can see there's a, quite a stark difference in the spatial context of where these immune cells are infiltrating. So in the hot tumor, we have the you know, green immune cells infiltrating throughout the tumor itself. And on the right-hand side, we have a cold tumor where the infiltrating uh, lymphocytes are just you know, really blocked by the, the border of the tumor itself. And you can imagine if you, you know, took these two pieces of tissue and we did uh, you know, a digestion and extracted the RNA and did bulk RNA-seq, you know, we wouldn't really understand the context of what's going on. And even at the single cell level, Right? We would identify the, the immune cells, we'd identify the tumor cells, but we wouldn't really have the context of you know, where these cells are living in, in this piece of tissue. And you know, that's where Visium and, and spatial gene expression comes in. So the Visium solution um, is really uh, uh, two pieces, and I'll talk about those in, in just a moment. But what I want you to kind of remember as we go through this talk is that uh, Visium is a unbiased whole transcriptome assay. And what that means is we don't need to really have any upfront knowledge of our tissue. So we're gonna capture that whole transcriptome information across the entire piece of tissue um, that's sitting on the Visium slide. Um, and you know, this is really important. You don't have to choose regions of interest. We don't have to choose gene targets up front. Um, we're gonna do a, a, a capture of all of the poly A adenylated mRNAs uh, in this tissue. And it's a really powerful uh, discovery uh, platform. So the, the workflow itself is kind of broken up into two pieces and I'm gonna walk us through both of these. And the first is what we call a tissue optimization workflow. Um, this is where we're going to determine um, you know, the optimal permeabilization time for our tissue. And then the second is the full gene expression workflow where we're going to stain our tissue, image it, 
and generate gene expression libraries that are going to go onto the Illumina sequencer that we can uh, merge together uh, bioinformatically. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the workflow itself. So the real magic behind the Visium technology are these Visium spatial gene expression slides that you can see here. Um, each Visium gene expression slide has four capture areas. Each one of these capture areas is six and a half millimeters squared. And inside um, each one of these capture areas are 5,000 unique barcoded spots. So we can see here, we're, if we're zooming in on this capture area, you can see we have all these different colored spots. And as we zoom in a little bit further, you can see we're zooming in on this blue and green dot here. Um, each one of these spots are 55 microns in diameter and center to center, they're 100 microns apart. So what this means is they're just staggered in a hexagonal uh, pattern to get them closer together. And this 55 microns is really, you know, what you can consider the resolution or like the size of the pixels in the gene expression data that we're going to see in uh, just a few moments. So inside each one of these spots is a lawn of oligos, and these uh, oligos are made up of four unique pieces. Uh, the first one being this read one sequencing primer. Um, this is just a, a oligo we use to prime off of to generate the sequencing libraries at the very end of the assay. The next portion uh, over on the other side is a poly DT tail. So this is what we use to capture the poly A tail, the mRNA, um, um, well, with this poly DT tail. And in between, we have two uh, barcodes. One is a spatial barcode, and this is a 16 nucleotide barcode that is unique to this individual spot. So we can see here, uh, this spot is blue, this spot is green, and then we have this green spatial barcode. So it's really important to remember is every single spot on um, these 5,000 spots in the Visium capture area is each going to have its own unique spatial barcode. And this allows us to determine the kind of the XY position of where the genes, uh, where the transcripts are occurring in our tissue after we sequence. And then next to the spatial barcode, we have a unique molecular identifier or UMI. And this UMI is unique to every single oligo on the slot, on the spot. So remember, the spatial barcode is unique to the spot. The UMI is unique to the individual oligos. And what this does is allows us to determine if the uh, transcript we're capturing here is unique or if it's going to be a PCR or amplification duplicate. So we can collapse down all the data and understand how many unique transcripts we captured using these UMIs. So the first part of the uh, workflow is doing what we call tissue optimization. And you know, this is a really important step. It's gonna tell us two things. Um, one, what is the optimal time that we wanna permeabilize our tissue? But two, this is really a, a nice QC step to understand if you're, you know, how your tissue is gonna work on the Visium platform without going through the entire you know, gene expression workflow. So the way this works is we're going to uh, section our fresh frozen tissue onto the tissue optimization slide. And if you notice here, there's actually eight capture areas on this uh, tissue optimization slide. And then we're gonna perform uh, staining and imaging. So we're gonna stain our tissue and we're gonna take, take an image of that. And then we're gonna try multiple time points for permeabilization. And this is where we're gonna permeabilize the tissue and allow the mRNA to fall out onto those capture areas on the slide where we can bind that uh, poly A tail uh, to, our, to our probes. And instead of you know, doing and generating a library, what we're gonna do here is uh, add in some fluorescent uh, cDNA uh, synthesis steps, and we're gonna take another image of the slide. So we're not gonna move through through sequencing. We're just going to add some fluorophores and, and understand the footprint of the cDNA uh, of the tissue itself. And uh, you know, in this example here, we have run eight different time points. So from zero minutes, three, six, 12, 18, 24, 30, and 36. And again, what we're trying to determine here is, you know, what is the appropriate permeabilization time to allow those transcripts to fall out onto our capture area without kind of dissolving the tissue and, and having those mRNAs spread out everywhere. So we want the RNAs to uh, fall directly down you know, into these capture areas. And what we're looking for here is trying to, you know, uh, with the cDNA footprint of the tissue, really understand, you know, how can we best, you know, capture the morphology of the tissue and the cDNA without uh, over permeabilizing or under permeabilizing. 
And um, you know, you can see here in these different time points, you know, what we're looking for is a nice crisp morphology of the tissue here without you know, kind of seeing any blurriness or, or background bleeding out of, of the tissue. And you know, you know, in this particular example, you can see there's not a lot of difference between 18 and 30 minutes. And you know, that's pretty common. And you know, one really important part of this part of the assay is that you know, we don't have to dial it into the exact minute, right? You don't have to know that you know, for this lung tissue, I need exactly 29 and a half minutes of permeization. What you're going to find is there's a nice window um, of, of correct permeization, and um, you just you know choose a time point in that window. It doesn't have to be dialed in exactly. And again, this is going to give us kind of the correct permeization time, but also allows us to see you know what our tissue is going to look like uh, using the vis the visium assay here. So every single tissue is going to behave a little bit differently in the lab. And you can see here, we have examples of you know, kidney, olfactory bulb, spleen, lung, and each one of these tissue types has a different optimal permeabilization time. And you know, this might depend on how thick you uh, section the tissue and as well as the tissue itself. And you're gonna have to go through this optimization uh, just uh, one time with your particular tissue. Um, so, for example, if you're working with um, human kidney, we'd optimize that tissue one time, find that correct time point, um, and then you wouldn't have to optimize again. You know, human kidney tissue would uh, work with this uh, permeization time. But then if you designed a mouse model and you had, you know, mouse kidney tissue, you would have to do the tissue optimization again. So just to, to point out, um, different tissues will have to be optimized a, a single time. Uh, but only uh, one time before you move on to the rest of the assay. So once we've gone through the tissue optimization, we can move into the full Visium workflow. And this is going to be the workflow where we're going to generate um, sequencing libraries um, and you know, really use that software to combine the data and um, uh, the, the, full, the full workflow. So uh, the way this works, uh, workflow works, is we're going to section our, our tissue on the cryostat onto the Visium slide. And then we have a choice of different staining methodologies. So when Visium was first released at the end of 2019, um, it was only compatible with H&E staining. Uh, but we recently released a workflow for doing immunofluorescence staining. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about immunofluorescence staining uh, later in the talk. But what I wanna point out is you have a choice up front whether you want to do, um, you know, get this morphological context with the H&E staining or get protein co-detection with immunofluorescence staining. So you choose which staining workflow you want to go through up front um, uh, with your tissue. So once we've uh, stained, uh, we're going to take a image of the tissue. And again, this is an image uh, before we do any, uh, you know, molecular biology steps, really, you know, staining, taking a picture of our tissue. And then we're going to go through uh, some process of barcoding and library construction, which I'll, I'll explain in just a moment. The uh, result of this is going to be a NGS sequencing library that's going to go onto an Illumina compatible sequencer. And then we have tools for data processing. Uh, this is a command line tool called Space Ranger. And Space Ranger is going to take the uh, imaging data and the sequencing data and combine those together and generate QC metrics and um, do differential gene expression. And then we have tools to visualize this. And our visualization tool is called Loop, and this runs on a PC or Mac. So if we kind of dive into the actual molecular biology steps going on here, um, you can see that you know, we, we sectioned and, and stained and imaged our tissue here. And then we're going to use that permeabilization time from the tissue optimization kit to, to permeabilize our tissue and allow those mRNAs to fall out onto our capture area. And then we're going to perform cDNA synthesis directly on the slide. And then we can pull the samples off the slide into micro centrifuge tubes to amplify and complete that library construction. And then from here, we can do some QC steps and then go on to the sequencer itself. Uh, for sequencing, uh, this is a kind of a unique uh, structure. It's a little bit different from our single cell libraries. Um, but what I want to point out here is that the libraries are dual indexed, which is compatible with Illumina's best practices uh, for, for sequencing libraries. 
And for sequencing depth, we want to aim for about 50,000 read pairs per spot that your tissue covered up. So what does that look like? So you can see here some examples of some H&E stained Visium slices here where this uh, particular tissue takes up about 75% of the capture area. This uh, uh, half hemisphere of mouse brain takes about 50%. Um, and this tissue takes up about 25%. So what you can do is you can say, well, my tissue is taking up half the slide. So that's 2,500 spots. Multiply that times 50,000 and get the amount of sequencing uh, necessary for that particular sample. Um, if you uh, aren't comfortable with, you know, estimating like that, we can pull the image of the tissue into our software and highlight it. In this case, you know, we've had this mouse brain sample that we've highlighted here. Um, this particular tissue takes up exactly 3,108 spots. So we can multiply that times 50,000 and, and get the sequencing requirements for this particular tissue. Uh, but again, you know, during development, uh, we just estimated and uh, the results looked really good. Um, so you can go and count the exact spots or just do an estimate uh, estimation. So that's the Visium workflow, right? The, the main thing is, you know, we're sectioning a piece of fresh frozen tissue. We're taking, we're staining it. We're going to take an image of it. Then we're going to generate gene expression libraries and the software is going to combine those together. So how have researchers been using this technology to, to do some experiments? And I'm going to go through a couple of those examples right now. Um, the first, this is some work from Berglund et al. out of the uh, SciLife lab in Sweden. And they were looking at generating uh, spatial maps of prostate cancer and understanding the transcriptional profiles of these cancer samples. And, you know, I, I really like this example because it kind of shows how you can take a larger piece of tissue like a uh, human prostate and how you can section it uh, to fit on the six and a half millimeter uh, square capture area of Visium. So you can see how they have this large section, 40 millimeters by 50 millimeters, and they chose different areas to uh, process through the Visium workflow. We can see the staining and uh, pathologist annotation uh, steps here. And then what uh, this group did was instead of looking at individual genes uh, across the tissue, they developed what they call factor activity maps, which are groups of genes. In this case, you can see the, uh, the factor activity map uh, for uh, their, their cancer markers here, and then overlay these factor signatures as a heat map on the tissue. So uh, one thing they did was uh, they had the pathologist annotate here, and you can see this giant blue ar arrow uh, pointing towards uh, this small red uh, annotation here where the pathologist uh, labeled this as cancer, as well as this area here for the uh, prosthetic interepithelial neoplasia or PINs. And then um, you can see the Visium data here on the right-hand side where they are looking at these different factor activity maps. So we can see the cancer factor activity map lighting up you know, really nicely uh, aligning with the pathologist annotation. Same with the pin gland markers. And then of course, uh, stromal markers across the tissue itself. But what the authors found really interesting is that you know, for some of the tissues, um, you know, this slide labels this as a missed annotation, but I, I think we could argue uh, whether it's really truly missed or not. Um, but the, the sensitivity of looking at gene expression by itself, we can see that there was no annotation by the pathologist in this tissue, but we are seeing a change in the transcriptome and we're seeing these uh, cancer factor activities kind of lighting up in this region here. So this really highlights the you know, sensitivity of looking at gene expression and we can see changes in the transcriptome before we're seeing you know, really uh, changes in the uh, histological images. Uh, the next, this is also uh, out of the SciLife lab. Um, and in this case, they were looking at HER2 positive uh, breast tumor microenvironments. Um, so again, they've sectioned the tissue, uh, ran it through the Visium workflow and uh, uh, clustered the data. And we're looking at the classification of immune cells and visualizing that on the tissue. And, you know, this is pretty interesting because we can see here the pathologist annotation of uh, uh, DCIS, an early form of breast cancer here in orange, um, invasive cancer uh, in this corner in red, and then immune cell infiltrate highlighted in or, uh, yellow here. 
And then uh, what the authors did was, again, generate this heat map of immune scores. So this is kind of a count of different immune cell markers. And we can see, you know, based on this heat map, this matches up really nicely with the pathologist annotation here. But as we dive a little deeper, we can, you know, really, you know, tease out some interesting uh, pieces of information. So first, if we look at uh, the markers for memory B cells, we can see that this matches up pretty nicely with the annotation by the pathologist here, where we have B cells here kind of in the yellow heat map, matches up really nicely with the pathologist annotation. But if we look at a different sub, uh, T cell subtype, in this case, if we look at T helper two cells, you can see the T helper two cell uh, population is really kind of um, spread out across this entire region here. And this is really interesting because the T helper two cells, right, are responsible for recruiting and activating other immune cells. In this case, the T helper two cells are there, but they don't really seem to do, be doing their job of recruiting and activating. So um, a pretty interesting, uh, you know, find here of, of immune cell infiltration. And you know, what's pretty interesting is those two examples I just went over, those were based on spatial transcriptomics or really the beta version of Visium. And you can see the resolution of the, of the beta version here. Um, but with the uh, Visium version one that we launched uh, in November of 2019, this is what the data uh, currently looks like. So you can see uh, much higher resolution with the 55 micron spots, as well as increased sensitivity uh, on the number of UMIs that we've been capturing. So this is one of the, uh, uh, the first preprint using uh, Visium version one um, uh, that came out. It recently was just uh, accepted um, uh, to a uh, journal, uh, but this is uh, the data from a bioarchive. And this is work from Dr. Maynard and Dr. Clara Torres at the Lieber, um, uh, at John Hopkins uh, Lieber Institute for Brain Development. And they were looking at the spatial gene expression across the human dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And you can see here again how they chose to uh, section the tissue and um, you know slice out this reason of the dorsolateral PFC for the Visium work. And they looked at uh, three neurotypical adult donors uh, for a total of 12 samples each. So what they did was um, what they call spatial replicates where they took a slice uh, for the Visium slide and then went 100 microns deeper and took a second slice. Uh, they sequenced these samples to about 300 million reads per sample, and what they detected were about 1,700 genes per spot on the Visium data. So the very first thing they wanted to see was with Visium, if they could detect the six known layers of the dorsolateral PFC. And we can see their uh, semi-guided clustering here on the right, or left-hand side, excuse me. And they were able to detect all six layers and um, ironically enough, the white matter uh, colored here in black. Um, but what I really love about this paper is that every step of the process, they go through and they do a um, uh, analogous check to you know, determine you know, what they were seeing with the Visium matches up with you know, what they were expecting. So in this case, we can see that um, you know, in layer five of the dorsolateral PFC, uh, PCP4 is a known layer enriched gene. So this is the uh, Visium data here, and we can see you know, this PCP4 gene lighting up in this horseshoe shape across kind of the center of the um, uh, dorsolateral PFC. And then they match this up really nicely with um, uh, stain data from the Allen Brain Institute. And we can see PCP4 kind of in the same horseshoe shape, uh, right in the same morphological area. So really nice uh, check on, on the data. So they were able to detect, you know, the known layer enriched genes across the dorsolateral PFC, but the authors went a step further and they wanted to see if with, with Visium, if they could find novel layer enriched genes, you know, across the, the PFC. And, um, and they were, this is a small subset from the paper itself. And what we can see here, um, aquaporin four is in, enriched in layer one, and we can see the fluorescence or the, the highlighting of that gene across the top of tissue here. Uh, TRABD2A in layer five, um, and, and so on. And again, they, they take a step back and they want to confirm this data. So they did SM fish staining, um, and hopefully this comes in over Zoom, but we have DAPI here, and we can see aquaporin four uh, here in red, and it's you know, highlighting in layer one. So a really cool confirmation of you know, what they're seeing in the gene expression data in Visium, 
and then what they were seeing, you know, using SMFish to confirm this. Um, the authors gave a really great uh, webinar hosted by ourselves and lab tools um, scientists um, in March of last year. Um, I definitely recommend if you want to learn a little bit more to, to take a look at this because what they do, they go further in the paper and take a disease state single cell data and map it upon uh, their, their Visium data. So really interesting work um, and, and really cool use of bioinformatic tools um, in this particular paper. Um, next is some work from uh, Dr. Koop and uh, Tavetsky out of um, Aachen University. And they were looking at the spatial um, transcriptome across a healthy and uh, infarcted human heart. And, you know, this is really cool because, you know, you know, one thing we get a lot of questions on is, you know, you know, what is the sensitivity when we think about these 55 micron pixels or spots? You know, what can I see at that resolution? And I think this really highlights uh, that question here where we have a healthy uh, heart here. And um, this is some of their single nuclei RNA-seq data here where they're looking at vascular smooth muscle cells. And these uh, VSMCs only make up about 1% of their uh, nuclear RNA-seq data. But they were able to you know, find the, you know, the genes expressed in these cells, they were able to find those in cluster two of the Visium data. So they were able to detect where these vascular smooth muscle cells were in their spatial data, um, even though it was a pretty small population of their, of their RNA-seq data. When they looked at um, you know, the myocardial infarction, um, what we have is um, ischemic zone, which is you know, where the infarction took place, the border zone, and the remote zone, which is unaffected. And this is an example of some of their border zone data. And what I, what I like about this is that, you know, in the H&E staining, we're not really seeing any histological changes. But if we look at the gene expression data, the authors point out that here between clusters six and seven, I'm gonna draw a little line with my pen to kind of, you know, better highlight this. Um, here we have, you know, a, affected gene expression. And down here we have kind of the, the more healthy tissue. So we're able to see this nice kind of distinct line in the Visium data that again, you know, that we haven't really been able to pick up um, histo histologically. And then of course we have, um, you know, uh, a fibrotic core here where it's, you know, very visible in the H&E data. And then we can pick up the same change in gene expression here. And when they looked at markers for um, uh, GLE-1, which is a marker for scar uh, tissue, they could see that all throughout the, the fibrotic core. So, Again, really cool work, and the the authors uh, go on further and you know overlay uh, both uh, single G, single nuclear uh, gene expression and attack data on, on top of their Visium data uh, for this particular work. Um, next, this is a, a new publication from Boyd et al. Um, this was published in Nature, and they were looking at the stromal cell population and the role of extracellular uh, matrix remodeling during a, a viral infection of mouse influenza A model. And again, you know, with everything going on, I always like to highlight these really cool um, uh, inflammation and immune papers. So uh, with their, their single cell data, what they found were that there was kind of three uh, functional states of um, fibroblasts in this paper. And they had um, extracellular uh, uh, matrix synthesis, uh, fibroblasts, resting, and um, uh, inflammatory. And as they looked at, as, at the inflammatory fibroblasts a little bit more, what they found was that there was a subset that they called damage responsive fibroblasts, or DR fibs, um, that's really kind of built up over the course of the infection. So they had time points at zero, one, three, and six days post-infection. And they saw this uh, cell population uh, expand um, over time. And then there was also a population of uh, these um, um, inflammatory uh, uh, fibroblasts uh, that were um, uh, uh, just like a little bit different that uh, appeared at three days post-infection and then dropped off pretty rapidly. So, you know, again, you know, we're thinking about Visium here. So they wanted to go forward and understand what was the, you know, inflammatory response on the tissue itself. If I zoom in on the Visium data here, we can see our h &E stained uh, image at the top. And if we look at the uh, unsupervised clustering of the gene expression here, we can really see there's two main populations. 
uh, cluster zero here in red, and I'll, I'll highlight this here, it's kind of making up this top portion and this bottom portion of the tissue. Um, and in yellow here, we have the normal alveolar uh, parenchymal cells. And you know what the authors found really interesting is that you know this uh, cluster zero, these inflamed uh, inflamed area, matches up really nicely with these damage responsive fibroblast signature that they found in these single cell data. And this is made up of uh, Adam TS4, LGTA5, and LOX. And what you can see here is that you know this matches up you know pretty nicely with what uh, they see in cluster zero. But you can see there's some dark spots here. Where we're not seeing these DR uh, fib signatures. And if we look at the unsupervised clustering, this matches up with cluster two, um, which are the bronchial regions. And if we kind of dive in, you know, a little further, and I think this is really one of the coolest parts about, you know, doing spatial gene expression, is that if we look at the, you know, expression of this Adam TS4 uh, gene, and I'm going to highlight a couple of these here. There's these red uh, spots where we have really high levels expression of this gene. And these all kind of occur right on the border between the inflamed tissue and the healthy tissue. And again, if I just kind of draw out where cluster zero sits here. So the authors, you know, really state that this, you know, marker Adam uh, TS4 and these um, uh, damage response of fibroblasts, you know, are really at the, the forefront of, you know, healthy and inflamed tissue. And you know they really think that this might be a good therapeutic marker um, or therapeutic target for um, you know, viral infections or or ARDS. So you know really cool kind of seeing what's happening like on these borders of you know normal and uh, and disease or, or inflamed tissue. Um, here is a really interesting paper where they utilize uh, skin tissue uh, in Visium. So they, uh, the authors were looking at human squamous cell carcinoma, and they did multiple uh, things here where they did um, uh, single cell genetics, they did the Visium spatial, and they also did uh, MIBI, um, which is multiplex uh, ion beam imaging for protein co-detection. And what they found was from their uh, single cell data, they discovered this uh, new cell, uh, cell type in the tumor microenvironment that they called tumor-specific keratinocytes. And these uh, cells uh, you know, had a really different you know, set of genes than normal epithelial cells, and they express a cascade that were indicative of invasive behavior and cellular movement. And when you kind of think about this invasive uh, behavior and cellular movement, it really would be cool to understand the spatial context of, of where these cells are living. So when they did the Visium work, what we can see here, um, the TSK cells are highlighted in blue. And what they found were these TSK, uh, TSK cells really resided, again, on this kind of border of, of the tissue, the leading edge of the uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So these uh, you know, tumor-specific keratinocytes, as well as the cancer-associated fibroblasts, you know, are really you know, the partners in crime on the kind of leading edge of pathology and, and tumor progression um, in this particular carcinoma. Again, you know, very, very exciting uh, spatial work. And you know, I, I couldn't uh, help but uh, throw in this paper in here. Um, I, I won't go into it too much because uh, some of the authors are, are on this call for sure. Um, but this is amazing work right here at IU looking at um, you know, the cellular response um, uh, in kidneys um, to, to sepsis. And um, I, I just wanna say uh, to, to anyone who's interested, I definitely recommend you uh, reach out to the authors and talk about their experience using Visium. Um, but to, to anyone on this call who helped work on this, um, there was a lot of excitement at 10X uh, when this was published, uh, looking at the data and the bioinformatic tools you use. So I just want to say uh, really, really beautiful work. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, Visium was released in November of 2019, but we've already made some um, additional um, things you can do with Visium since it launched. Uh, the very first thing that we added was the ability to do a targeted gene expression from the Visium data. And what this allows you to do is kind of move from that like large discovery work down to a more focused um, uh, experimentation. And this could uh, you know, help uh, save some, some money and some analysis time when we think about uh, doing targeted gene expression. So what's uh, you know, really cool about the way uh, that 10X does the targeted gene expression is that we use a bait and probe approach on the whole transcriptome library. 
So you generate the you know, uh, gene expression libraries like normal, and then we're gonna pull down our genes of interest and sequence those. But what makes this powerful is that if you find something interesting in your targeted work, you always have that original whole transcriptome to return to and, and um, you know, generate that whole transcriptome library. Um, we have four uh, pre-designed panels, and you know what I want to point out here is that our panels are pretty large, so you can see between 1,000 and 1,200 genes. And the reason for this is that we found that using a panel of about 1,000 genes really helps us recapitulate that whole transcriptome information and do all the cell type calling, um, even though we're using a targeted approach. So we have a, a human pan cancer, a human immunology, a human neuroscience, and a human gene signature panel. So uh, we only have human panels available now, but we are working on getting uh, panels for other model organisms. Um, unfortunately, this was a little slowed down due to uh, a pandemic, but um, hopefully we'll have more information on those soon as well. We also released the ability to do immunofluorescence staining um, for Visium. And I mentioned this at the beginning where you're gonna choose, you know, do you wanna do h &E staining or do you wanna do immunofluorescence staining for protein co-detection? So I don't have any uh, published papers yet uh, using immunofluorescence, but I wanted to show you what some of the data looked like here. So this is Visium with a human ovarian tumor. And we can see where we have a stainless for PNCK, which is a, um, a marker for human cancer cells, a CD45, it's a stromal marker, and then uh, of course, DAPI. And we can you know, look at each one of these images separately or all of them uh, overlaid together. But again, you know, the power of Visium is looking at this gene expression on top of, you know, our, our visual data. So if we, you know, highlight two genes here, and this is uh, two genes from cluster one uh, of this data, uh, TOPE2A and XPO1, these are both markers for uh, human cancers. And what we can see is that the expression of these genes really nicely overlays with the PAN-CK stain. And again, this is really highlighting that, you know, we're getting confirmation of we're detecting this you know, marker in the protein space. Um, and we're seeing, you know, similar human cancer markers in the gene expression space as well. Another thing we can do is instead of looking at individual genes, we can look at sets of genes. So in this case, we are looking at the expression of CD19, CD79A, and CD79B, which are B cell markers. And from these set of markers, we can make inferences of where we're seeing B cells across our tissue. And again, this uh, matches up you know, pretty nicely with where we're seeing the CD45 stain. Um, our software, the Loop Browser, is a really good way to you know, get started analyzing your data. You can see here, it's really easy to turn on and off the different layers of the immunofluorescent staining. This is a human spinal cord data here. Um, we can see our different layers of gene expression uh, over here on the right. And then at the bottom, we have a table where we can look at the differential um, expression of the different genes across the different clusters. And again, you know, this is, instead of looking at the immunofluorescence, this is the gene expression data. And what you can do is we have this little opacity, uh, spot opacity slider here where we can slide this back and forth and change between looking at the you know, fluorescence data or h &E data, and then kind of you know, where we're seeing the gene expression. So it's really easy to hop back and forth and um, look at both different modalities in our software. So you know, we've added target, we've added immunofluorescence. Uh, what else do we have coming in the future to the Visium platform? And I think this is really cool because you know, we are investing a lot of uh, R&D into you know, constantly improving a Visium and adding the ability to do more things. Um, the first uh, thing that we will have coming out is the ability to do a highly multiplex uh, protein analysis on Visium using what we call feature barcode technology. And this is something that um, you may be familiar with our single cell assay. And um, what we can do is we can use antibodies that are specific for different proteins that have a um, oligo tag attached to them. And we can capture this tag um, on the same uh, spots that we're capturing the gene expression data. And you know, what's really exciting about this is we don't have to worry about spectral overlap or fluorophore bleaching or anything like that. We're getting an NGS readout of these proteins. Um, so really the power to multiplex is, is basically unlimited, you know, based on the number of barcodes possible. Um, 
And we've seen people in the single cell space do, you know, 220 or 230 proteins at once. And this is kind of this highlighting the data here where we have immunofluorescence data of CD29 and CD4. Um, we can see that, you know, in the image, and then we can look at the antibody derived tag data for the exact same markers and see we have really good correspondence between these. Um, this is just some preliminary data um, uh, from us in BioLegend, and we should have some more information on this uh, coming out pretty soon. Uh, one big thing that uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm seeing the chat pop up, um, uh, probably one of these questions is going to be about FFPE. Um, currently, Visium is compatible with fresh frozen OCT embedded tissue, um, but we will have a FFPE solution for uh, Visium coming out in just a couple months. So uh, Q2 is the kind of closest window I have, but I don't have an exact date yet. Um, but this is going to be a high sensitivity whole transcriptome assay for FFPE uh, samples. Uh, one thing to note that this will not be a poly A based uh, capture. Um, again, this is, you know, kind of showing the same thing. It's going to be still based on the same technology, but the capturing is going to be a little bit different. And I do have some preliminary data to show you here. Um, this is some data we generated from a two-year-old FFPE sample of triple positive breast cancer. Um, we can see here uh, uh, from this two-year-old sample, we are able to identify eight different clusters of differential gene expression. And then we can see the expression of the, you know, three positive genes in this uh, particular breast cancer, ESR1. PGR1 and, and HER2 here. And you can see really uh, you know, nice uh, you know, uh, resolution here across this FFP tissue. So you know, uh, getting you know, gene expression from FFP tissue is difficult because of the degradation that we get during the, the process. Um, but this is some uh, uh, data that we showed at JP Morgan this year showing that with this Visium for FFPE, we're getting, you know, almost the same sensitivity that we are from uh, fresh frozen samples. So this is really exciting. And we should have some additional data uh, towards the end of the month that I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, lastly, uh, we announced at JP Morgan that uh, next year, uh, we will be uh, kind of increasing the resolution of Visium. Um, you can see here, we're calling this Visium HD. Um, we don't have the exact size of these spots, but uh, we mentioned that would be uh, below uh, sub 10 microns. Um, so again, you know, we're putting a lot of work into making Visium uh, easier and more accessible and, you know, adding on requests that uh, people have asked for. And one of those was increasing the resolution of the spots. So um, at the end of this month, we are hosting what's called the 10X Experience. Um, this is where we're going to be showing a lot more of our FFPE Visium data. Um, I definitely recommend if you have FFPE samples that you uh, attend this. Um, you can register at 10xgenomics.com slash experience. And I apologize for the spelling. Um, or if you need a link, uh, please feel free to reach out to uh, Jay or myself. Um, and again, we're gonna have a lot more of the FFP data um, other than this, that one uh, preliminary data that I, that I showed you. Um, so with that, you know, I know today is, uh, you know, the Lunar New Year, but it is also Darwin's birthday. So I wanted to put this picture uh, from his lab notebook. I, I just love this. He wrote, you know, I think here, and we have, you know, one of the first, uh, you know, kind of diagrams of, you know, species differentiating. Um, I just want to put this in there so you remember to take good uh, notes in your lab notebook um, because you never know when you're going to look back and, you know, have something amazing in your lab notebook and just that you wrote, I think, you know, uh, this is a, I always love this picture. And um, with that, um, we can open it up for questions. And I really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, All right. To me uh talk today. It was a great turnout, actually. Uh, thank you very much for everybody's coming. Uh, and there are a couple of questions that are coming out, and uh, I think some of them has been answered uh, along your presentation. Great. Uh, but but I, I do want to uh, uh, repeat some of the information, some of the questions. So the first question is, uh, uh, is about the resolution. I think Jay answered that, that uh, maybe Spence, you want to uh, repeat what the current resolution is and what is the, the HD version will be. Yeah, the, the current resolution is 55 microns. 
Um, and the HD, so we haven't officially uh, said what the, the size of the pixels or the, the resolution will be. We did mention it'll be below 10 microns. So it's gonna be in the single, we said single digit uh, microns. So anywhere between one and nine. Um, I will say again, that's that's gonna be coming out in you know sometime in the middle of next year. So we do have a little bit of a wait on that. Um, but there are bioinformatic tools to kind of uh, tease out what is happening in these individual spots, if that's of interest to you. Um, so there's tools called uh, Spotlight, and there's some a couple other third-party tools where you can take single-cell data and kind of tease out you know what's happening in those individual spots and generate you know little pie graphs showing you know the percentages of of different cells. Also, if you're you know using a DAPI stain, you could look at you know the number of, of nuclei that you're capturing per spot. I would say, in general, um, what we see in house and what I've seen in publications is that in these 55 micron spots, you're going to be capturing between one and 10 cells. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, actually, uh, so you just mentioned that the, the HD version will come off mid of next year. You're yes, 22. Yeah, well, is that we say the first half of 2022. Okay, so it will be a while. Yes. All right, okay. Uh, actually, a related question is from me about the, the sensitivity in terms of your detection for the samples. So I, I, I know, I mean, it is, I mean, based on our single cell work and our experience, we know it's tissue dependent and uh, it's your condition dependent on your, your tissues. Um, but I do realize that when you look into the brain, sample that data you mentioned that each one you only detect about 1700 by average genes is that a little low for for like a tissue like brain for a human brain um i i think that's pretty reasonable uh for a mouse brain that would be a little low right there's just a lot more heterogeneity in, in mouse tissue and we, we capture more transcripts so it's going to depend on your tissue itself just like you mentioned but also with visium the thickness of the tissue that we that we section, right? So um, we we recommend kind of starting out at 10 microns, but if you have a, a thicker slice of tissue, you're gonna have more cells per spot and you're gonna have more transcripts per spot. So it is gonna depend on, on the tissue itself and you know how you section it and the kind of gene expression across that tissue as well. Okay. No, I, I think uh, there is a, a, a cluster of questions about uh, the optimization part of it. Sure. And, uh, and I assume that there is some level of guidelines provided by 10X. You guys have already have initial permanentization conditions that can help people. Is that correct? Yeah. So we try not to give any advice on the, the time points. We can give you, we usually recommend, you know, starting between like three minutes and 30 minutes. Um, if you need a little more guidance than that, you definitely reach out to our tech support because, you know, some tissues um, require even longer, you know, 45 minutes or 50 minutes. Um, and we can, we can kind of guide you. We, we will not tell you for, you know, brain tissue, use 12 minutes because the way you section the tissue and the environment in your lab is going to be a little bit different at every single site. So, um, but what we found is once you do that optimization once, you should be good in your in your lab. That only needs to be one done one time per tissue, and we'll we'll give you some guidance, but we we won't we are not comfortable saying, you know, for lung do X, for brain do Y. Sure, but you have a starting point that people can refer to that to, to uh, plan their experiment, and that I think that's yeah. what people are looking for. That's okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can give you some guidance on you know designing that first kind of window there, based yeah. on our experience. Uh. So, so the next question is, uh, I think Jay answered that in the chat is, uh, can the, the HNE staining and the, uh, and the fluorescent staining be done together? Um, yeah, so you can't do it on the exact same slice of tissue, but you could do it on consecutive slices. Um, so you could do a serial slice. So slice one, HNE, slice two, uh, immunofluorescence. And again, that's one of the difficult when, uh, difficulties when thinking about spatial and working with tissue is that it's, you, you can never have an exact biological replicate, right? Because every slice is slightly different. Well, that's as close as we can get to doing a replicate or kind of getting that information from, from the same uh, slice. All right. Uh, 
Great. So uh, another set of question is about the, the tissue types that uh, that are being tested as well as whether it's possible. Uh, I, I see that some of the people from the musculoskeletal center uh, talk about uh, the the bone sections and uh, and uh, I, I think there are a lot of interest in muscles as well. Are are those being tested? Can can be done. Very, that's a very good question. So I would say um, bone and, you know, specifically if you're trying to do a slice with like bone and bone marrow, it gets very difficult, right? Because the uh, trying to demineralize the bone while still maintaining the, you know, the intersection is, is very difficult. I have not seen anyone be successful uh, doing that yet. Um, but we have seen people be successful with other difficult tissues like that skin example. So skin is something that we, uh, we had difficulty uh, you know, working on in-house, um, but that paper really showed that it is possible and, and they have really good recommendations uh, to working with skin there. Um, I'm just trying to uh, open my web browser. We have a list of tissues that we tested in-house um, that I'd be happy to post in chat in just, some, in just a moment once I uh, pull that up. That'd be great. So if you give us Throw some free, free samples and we can test it back for you as well. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the, the benefits of using the tissue optimization kit. So like I said, you can use that just as a test to see, hey, will my tissue work? And looking at that cDNA footprint will give you a really good idea. If you can get a really nice, clean cDNA amplification, that's, that's a really positive sign that the full gene expression assays it will work successfully on Visium. All right. Um, Another question that some of the people here are working in bacteria, and that there are there are no, no poly A um, mature MRAs, and that there are cell, cell wall issues. And uh, I think that's a potentially a problem for the 10X in terms of single cell part, but how about for spatial, is that uh, uh, doable? Yeah, it's gonna be the exact same, um... I guess, uh, limitations that we have at the single cell level, right? We're doing that poly A capture. Um, I, I will say there are, you know, quite a few publications of getting viral, um, you know, transcripts out of our single cell data, even though it's using a poly A capture. Um, so there are examples of that, you know, uh, publicized and you should be able to get the, you know, you, should, you could be able to look for that as well in the Visium data. One thing I'll say though is our software uses a uh, human reference um, or, or you know, whatever reference you use. If you're trying to catch viral transcripts, you'll have to include those transcripts in your reference um, that you're aligning to in our software. Great. Uh, uh, next question is uh, uh, if you were to do this analysis on serial section uh, and can your software compile Com compile a 3D image? Or... Yeah, so uh, our software cannot do that yet, but there's a really great example from a paper uh, from ASP et al, um, where they did that with the developing uh, mouse embryonic hearts, uh, where they took nine serial sections and generate this really cool 3D model um, that you can rotate around and, and look at the gene expression uh, spatially you know, on the 3D heart, which is really amazing work. Can, can we wear our VR, my VR headset into? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can, you know, swim, <laughs> swim through the uh, gene expression data. Uh, that would be really <laughs> cool. Um, um, and, and, the, and Jill, you are going to help me to take a look at whether there are questions that I missed, but I do see a question that is related to the core operation and uh, uh, at which stage that, uh, which part of the work will be done in the individual lab and which part it should be in, done in the core. Um, I think this is a very important question. And uh, as you can see from this, there are multiple technologies and expertise are needed, right? Starting from the biology, of course, and then the histology side and the genomic side. And there are uh, the imaging part as well as the bioinformatics analysis. So over the past couple of uh, months that actually we have been working with multiple cores together uh, that we include the histology core and, uh, and uh, in us, the genomics core as well as microscopy core and trying to join force to uh, streamline the whole process. So the current uh, workflow, and of course we are still working with, uh, still trying to test whether this will work out or not, is uh, um, if you don't have any experience, you want to start from us from the start the beginning, Actually, we will help you coordinate all the uh, coordination across different cores. 
We'll start from uh, your sample and uh, we'll give you guideline in terms of freezing and, uh, and delivery to the um, uh, uh, histology core. And after cross-sectioning there, and then the tissue will be sent to genomics core. We'll do the, the staining, we will do the uh, permanentization. And then our uh, technical staff uh, will bring that aside after uh, a certain level of treatment, bring to microscopy core and to take the images and then bring it back to, a, to the genomics core finish the library preparation, of course, so that we can do the sequencing uh, after that. And, uh, and then we can either go with the bioinformatics uh, uh, units of the CMG or, or um, other uh, collaborators in terms of data analysis. So to answer that question more straightforwardly, I think uh, it would depend, depends on your, your uh, preferred entry point. And uh, I think uh, we, we will try our best if you don't have any expertise, including histology that from the beginning we'll work with the uh, histology core. But if your lab has uh, extensive experience on that, uh, and uh, we can start from uh, the, the slides that uh, are taken into the genomics core, and we'll do the permanentization together and then uh, doing the library preparation with the, the condition that being optimized. Or uh, there are some users having the extensive uh, experience in uh, the whole staff and we're also open to take the library that you generated and then, then dump on our sequencer and to finish the, the, the sequencing analysis. Okay. So a long story short, we'll be flexible. Um, okay. I have a specific question because we do lots of frozen sections and we can clearly put sections on slides. The issue that I am not sure of is, are these images being taken on a confocal? Are they being taken on a wide field? I mean, it's just h and &E, I would imagine. So do you have, do you have the, like, what are the scope parameters? What are the things that we need to do to get proper images so this works? Yeah, we have a, a imaging guideline uh, document that gives the specific uh, resolution uh, for both h &E stained images as well as uh, immunofluorescent images. Um, and um, I can post that in chat in just a moment. That, that would be great. So how stable, so like I'm on a cryostat, I'm, I'm dumping sections on this slide. You know, what, is there any kind of like RNA degradation clock that I'm fighting? Do I need to get this thing like stained in 10 seconds? Or, you know, the, 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 the issue with this is, you know, the workflow obviously on paper looks very straightforward, but yeah. if it has a temporal component to it, which I would assume it would, you know, that's kind of where I'm trying to figure this out. Sure. It's a really good question. So um, from what we recommend is as you are slicing your tissue on the cryosat onto the Visium slide, um, you can hold the tissue on that slide at negative 80 for four weeks um, before we move on to the next step. Once you, uh, you know, have all four sections and you can do like one section, you know, week one, you know, another section on week two, you can kind of space out the sectioning however makes sense uh, in your lab. Once you move on to the staining and imaging, that is kind of a step where you want to do your staining and do your imaging kind of in a, in a fast process, right? Um, tissues like, you know, open to the environment at room temperature. Um, and then kind of from there, we want to move on to the molecular biology steps. That's, and, and then there's more safe stopping points uh, after that. So do you even have to stain the tissue? I mean, you know, if you can get a good face contrast picture of your tissue, like I'm just gonna be sectioning through hearts or embryos. I know what it looks like. You know, is the software going to need that stain in order to integrate the single cell data that's coming off of those little baby chip things? Yeah, so it uses the uh, fluorescence uh, from the these fiducials that go around the capture area um, from the imaging data, and it uses that to align the gene expression data on top of the imaging data. Um, I do not know if you can kind of skip the staining step and, and move forward, but I, I'll be happy to ask our support if anyone has tried that and, um, and let you know. And, and then just, when you say H and E, do you have to do both H and E or can you just do an ESN stain to get the contrast? Yeah, so um, as far as I know, I haven't heard anyone not doing both, um, but I don't see why you would have to. Um, 
But again, I can ask and see if we, we well, time, if we try that in, in development. I mean, it takes less time to do an yeah. eosin stain than it does to do a hematoxyl in an eosin stain. Because I'm assuming you're dipping these things in like, you know, dehydration, rehydration buffers. And so, you know, the concern is you're losing RNA through this process at some level. Yeah, and you know that brings up a good point because the immunofluorescence staining it actually you know takes much longer than the H and E stain workflow. And you know what we saw in development is that there wasn't you know a dramatic loss in RNA in, in taking that longer step of immunofluorescence. So um, you know time is of an essence. Like we don't want it's you know the slide sitting on the imaging platform for you know three days. Um, you, you kind of move that fairly fast, but you know, what we've found is even in the longer IF staining protocol, we didn't really see uh, much change in, in gene expression. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think at a certain point, we probably need to do some of the pilot to answer more specific questions because of different tissues are different as well. Uh, no, I think that's a, that's a very, very good question. Very important discussion. Uh, there's a question about the cost. Uh, I think, uh, um, I mean, of course, it, it will depends on how the experiment will be done, and uh, and there are many other factors to to con to to consider. But overall, that including the library prep and the sequencing, so we, we have a rough estimation is somewhere around between two thousand to to twenty five hundred dollar per sample. Per sample means one of the four slides, one of the one. One of the four uh, slides on, on Spence's uh, 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 PowerPoint slides. So, so you, now one slide would be eight k. I mean more than that, but uh, so so yes, yeah, so it's something around that range. Uh, so let's uh, uh, it should be covered within twenty five hundred dollars per sample. So we're talking about ten k cost. And I assume there is another smaller. Uh, slides that they call the gateway slide that has the two capture areas, but that one per capture area, the, the cost will be even higher. Um, yeah, but it, this is really, don't quote me on that yet, because this is a, just to give you a rough estimation. And there are specific parts that involves in the experimental design that, for example, how, how, how many times the permanentization that we, we do need to go through because it, uh, th there are separate costs for that in, in, in terms of uh, comparing to the other part of the experiment. Uh, so I think uh, just give you a rough estimation so it, you can think of in your grant application or whatever, but, uh, uh, but we will need to discuss the exact experiment de design to have a, a, a more accurate code. Uh, so so I, I wanna just, sorry for being a monopoly here, but we're gonna do this. Um, the, the question I have is got to do with the sample prep. So for your typical cryopreservation and your typical H&E staining, do we just do that as we normally do that with these slides? Or do you guys have a specific, you know, any modifications or changing to the cryo? I mean, obviously we're not gonna PFA fix anything according to what I listened to, but like, is there any change in times? Is there any like specific solutions or you know, alcohols that you want us doing? Yeah, we have uh, very specific recommendations. Um, you know, I know specifically for the H and E staining, we give uh, recommendations on which you know hematoxylin and eosin stain to use, because we we have found that you know from different companies, uh, we did see different results. So uh, we recommend using the ones that we use in development that had the least effect on on the gene expression, and um, we we can send that information over to you as well. Please do that. No, I think uh, Tony, uh, maybe if you have a specific question that we can, uh, I mean, uh, we can we can chat about offline. Let's go go through to see whether there are other questions. Sure. Uh, and uh, I, and is there any other question regarding this? I think we can open up, and whoever has a question, you can either raise your hand or unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, why those come in? One thing I, I didn't mention is the thickness of the tissue. Um, so it's going to be really dependent on what you are comfortable sectioning, but what we found that in general, 10 micron thickness works great. You may want to go thicker if you have a uh, tissue that contains uh, a lot of fat um, that seems to crumple or fold uh, more, more often on the cryostat, so you may have to go thicker. Um, and we've tested, you know, going down to five microns as well. So um, 
you know, 10 is a good starting point, but you could go thicker or thinner depending on your tissue. Is thicker better? Uh, no, thinner, thinner would be preferable, right? Because we, in, if we get a perfect one layer of cells, that would be the, the optimal uh, thickness. Can but I ask my, a quick question, please? Yeah, yeah Charlie, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I, I, it's a fantastic uh, technology. I, uh, my question is more on the, the balance side. So what's the success rate uh, for doing this type of experiment? I mean, uh, I would imagine there would be some uh, uh, failed uh, uh, reactions at some point. Yeah, I mean, you know, with uh, anything, you know, biology is very complex, but what I'll tell you is if your tissue works fine on the tissue optimization slide, um, I have very little concern that you won't get really good data on the full gene expression assay. Um, and, you know, like anything from, you know, 10X, this is a full, fully supported kitted solution, right? This is not a, a academic homebrew method. Um, so we're really comfortable with how robust the assay is and, and we support it fully with a, you know. I see. So, I mean, you don't see any problem in the downstream, like uh, from the, uh, you know, formulation, the library construction and some other steps. So, so you don't have any problem with the downstream steps. Well, Charlie, that's a question for me. We have a lot of problem. We fail our experiment constantly. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I think those are the parts that I, we, will, we will be able to uh, optimize and try our best. And I think uh, uh, if there is a, a, a issue that not related to tissue, but, uh, but because of our parts uh, that certain step failed, that we will go back to, to redo those. And, uh, and based on our experience with 10X in terms of uh, um, single cell, and I, I don't see a big uh, hang up over there. And I, I assume that this one, actually the logistics is, is even easier than the single cell uh, study because it, you give us the, I mean, we start from the frozen sample and not the, the live samples. Uh, so Spencer, is that fair? I, I think that's fair. And that's one of the reasons why I try to give like a, a wide variety of samples when I was going over what people have published on. Um, this to show how robust it is with different sample types. And, um, I, you know, I think I, we're very confident with the robustness of the assay. And of course, you know, things can always go wrong, but we have a really great field application scientist group as well as a technical support group to, um, you know, help the core and help, help you, um, you know, move through the assay as well. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. So, so Spencer, I have another question actually, maybe some of the clarification that audience need to know that I know that some of them, uh, that your, your sample start from the frozen sample, uh, which uh, you, you will need to have the OCT uh, part. Uh, and um, and, and the, the question is, uh, uh, there are some of, I mean, I know there's a guidelines that if the sample has not been frozen yet, and there are certain things that you do the OCT embedding and then freeze it down, there's specific guideline for that. But there are other some samples that we use, we, don't, we really don't have a control, right? So we, we study brain that the, the only sample we have is the fr fresh frozen. Is there any guidelines in terms of getting the, the tissue prepared in the most optimal position even before to put on the stand, uh, the Chris stand? Yeah, we have a very specific uh, sample prep uh, demonstrated protocol uh, for um, uh, what we found the best practices for freezing and embedding the tissue. And we recommend doing like a, a double broiler method um, where we have, um, I believe it's isopentane, um, in a liquid nitrogen bath to freeze it rather than freezing your tissue in liquid nitrogen directly. A um, reason for that is we found that it, uh, if you go directly into liquid nitrogen, it kind of, uh, you know, flash freezes the outside, but doesn't get the center. Um, and we can get some cracking on the outside of the tissue. And again, we're really trying to maintain uh, intact tissue morphology in this assay. Um, so um, we'll, we'll share that protocol with you. And it's, it's, the very first thing you should look at um, as you think about preparing your samples is, is looking at these guidelines. So in our experience of cryopreserving, you basically go through a sucrose gradient before you even the samples even see OCT. So we're not doing that in this protocol? Uh, we are not. Um, trying to find the, the protocol itself here. One moment, but uh, no, I do not believe so. So, so Spence, there are. How do you get the 
to permeabilize that because obviously if you didn't need to do the sucrose, you would just put everything in OCT from the start. But I'm not sure I understand the question. So the permeation step is, is later on um, after. So you have to prep the tissue for the OCT. Like if you just put a piece of tissue in OCT, it's not just going to magically suck up into the tissue so that sure. you can freeze it properly. You go, you run it through a sucrose gradient, you know, which is done at four degrees. It's not done at minus 20. And if you're not fixing the tissue, you know, that's a lot of time and just getting the sample ready to be cryosection. It won't section well if it's not prepared correctly. Just... Yeah. yeah. I'll... So I think uh, uh, Lillian, is, are, are you there trying to speak something? I'm sorry, I, I hear someone was speaking. Uh, who was that? I think it was Nuria and I, she might have dropped off. Okay, all right, go ahead. Oh. So uh, yeah, I was gonna say, I, I, I would just have to look over the, the, uh, the demonstrated protocol myself. Um, it's something I have not looked over in a little while. But I, I definitely could send that over to you and we could talk about the recommendations. Yes, I would appreciate that. Sure. So Spence, you obviously mentioned a lot of resource and I think uh, if we're digging hard enough, it will all be in the uh, 10X website, but that is, uh, that is uh, so, so is that possible that you can uh, drop me an email and send all the, the links of specific questions so that we can distribute that to all the attendees here. Yeah, that I can definitely do that. I'll have a list of links um, and resources uh, for, for everyone to get started and I'll send out to you and, and we can uh, share it that way. Great. Uh, so so um, is there any other questions uh, about this? And, and Tony, uh, please just stay after this so that we can chat about a little more on the specific of your projects. Uh, I want to see whether any other questions from the audience. All right, if not, uh, thank you very much, Spence. And uh, it was great. And I think, uh, uh, I hope that, uh, uh, I mean, everybody learned a lot. I do learn, I did learn a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that we will have a lot of usage in the near future. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you all so much for, for taking the time to listen to me. I know everyone is getting uh, Zoomed out, but, um, the, you know, the response and questions I always get from, from talking to the researchers um, up at IU and Purdue and Notre Dame, it's always amazing. It's great working with you guys. Yeah, great. Uh